We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we live, work and play. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and recognise their continued connection to these lands and waterways. We acknowledge our shared responsibility to care for and protect our place and people. Today we are joined by Alex Elliot Howery um, from Cornersmith, which is a family run business, including a cafe, a cooking school, and of course the cookbooks. They have a desire to build community through ethical food choices, education, and sustainable business practice. Alex's interest in preserving came about when her children were young and there was an abundance of fresh fruit on trees in her neighborhood. She tried her hand at making jams and preserving and Cornersmith has grown from there. Lemons and other citrus tend to thrive in the cooler months. So when life gives you lemons, Alex is here to show us <laughs> how we can preserve them before they spoil. And I'd just like to welcome Alex. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for um, coming along and being here at seven o'clock on a, whatever night it is, Thursday night. Much appreciated. That was a very nice intro and it sounds a lot more romantic than it is. So when the stories of the trees being very abundant is true. Um, I live in Dulwich Hill in Sydney, which is a Greek neighbourhood, and there's heaps of fruit trees. So when I was um, trying to figure out how to eat sustainably at home, I um, kind of just got it had the back of my head. I was like, preserving is a thing. I had no idea. I did not grow up preserving at my grandmother's knee whatsoever. I am fully self-taught. Um, so I just was in the back of my mind. And when I would, you know, push the prams around the neighbourhood, I would see all this citrus generally um, dropping on the ground. So there'd be mandarins or oranges or lemons um, in the winter and in summer we would see, you know, the figs and the mulberries dropping on the ground. So I just thought I couldn't quite figure it out, but then I realised that newer families were moving into the area that didn't have the skills and the knowledge of how to deal with the bounty of stuff. So I started knocking on people's doors like a psycho when I look back on it. And I always kind of like took the kids so it didn't seem like I was, you know, in completely insane. Um, I'd be like, hello, you know, I can see you've got a kumquat tree or an orange tree. Would you mind if I picked your excess? And most people were so into it and they didn't, they just mainly didn't know what to do with it, didn't know how to deal with the amount that was growing, um, had no idea about preservation and were really sick of seeing it rotting in the backyard or on the footpath. I would take something home, I would teach myself how to make jam, how to make marmalade, how to preserve lemons, whatever it was. And um, if it was good, and there was a lot of bad ones, like I, as I said, I am not a chef, I am not, I didn't let grow up preserving, so I had to learn as I was going. I would drop a jar back to whoever's tree I had um, taken the fruit from. And I built up this really nice connection in my neighbourhood that I didn't even really know what I was doing, but I was um, kind of trying to make, I guess, understand around food and food traditions and food waste, and I wanted to understand preserving, but in an urban area where there, it, it is harder to have that connect of where our food comes from, um, how it, you know, how we deal with it in our households and how we dispose of it as well. So I was given lots of family recipes. You know, we talked lots about gardening. Um, and I guess for me, that was the beginning of what Cornersmith has become, which was that I really am interested in trying to draw awareness and educate people about how you can live in urban areas and make really good, thoughtful, sustainable choices in your kitchen as well. So all the work that I've done over the last 10 to 12 years has that in mind. And I guess Cornersmith's now grown into a bit more of a food community and we've become um, advocates for sustainability and for food waste as well. So I think preserving... Um, if you've never done it before, or even if you have done it before, it's really important to understand why preserving makes so much sense right now in 2023. So I feel like there is a bit of nostalgia around preservation, which is like adorable and, you know, wear a kerchief and oh, some yeah. lipstick and make something cute. Um, whereas what I think actually we need to look at is like, yes, that is, um, you know, it's nice to have a nod to the past, but actually preservation comes came it exists in every single culture because there is a huge value placed on food. So you would never throw something in the bin 
that, that you could use, basically. We have been taught to waste food in our industrialised food system um, and we need to unlearn that and we need to learn how to use everything that we have. So we are in our own tricky times right now with the climate emergency and with the cost of living. So preservation suddenly makes sense again. Now, I don't want you to feel like we have to spend the entire weekend, you know, making 400 jars of marmalade or bottling your own tomatoes. That's all lovely to do. But the skills that I also want to teach you is what do you do when you've got three old mandarins in the fruit bowl that your kids have decided they hate mandarins? Or what do you do if there's, you know, a couple of lemons and you just want to give it a bit of a try? So, and then also what to do with all the scraps as well. So I'm really interested in you learning how to preserve, to fill up your pantry and, you know, be a homesteader. But I'm more interested in you using preservation kind of as part of your weekly or, you know, monthly kitchen routine and really normalise it, I guess. So it doesn't seem like this is cute crafty skill, but it seems like a really valuable tool in your kitchen. Citrus and tomatoes are the times where I get really busy with my um, preserving, both at our, um, in my business at the cafe, but also at home as well. Um, we're lucky we have access to so much fruit and vegetable all year round, but when you buy citrus out of season, you there's a couple of things that are going on. Firstly, it's really, really expensive. Secondly, it's being flown in from the other side of the world. So the food miles, the hidden environmental costs of eating out of season are really, really detrimental, not just to your hip pocket, but also environmentally. So now is the time. Citrus is cheap now. It's the oranges are around, lemons are around, limes have just finished up and blood oranges will be coming. Um, but we're in it right now. So instead of just buying, you know, a couple of them here and there, what I want you to do is preserve as much citrus as you can over the next couple of months so that when it comes to summer, you don't have to buy expensive imported um, fruits and um, vegetables as well. And that goes for everything. Like, please, if you want to do one sustainable thing in your kitchen, make sure that you eat seasonally. And we have Google, so there is no excuses. You can just figure it out. Um, with citrus preserving, it's um, really, really versatile. All the recipes you have, you can interchange. So it doesn't have to be lemons or oranges. It can be a mix of whatever you want. I did want to start off with marmalade because I feel like everyone should know how to make marmalade. Um, and if you don't love it yourself, it makes an excellent, excellent gift. Um, and it's really cheap to make. If you have a citrus tree, unfortunately, marmalade doesn't actually get rid of that many. Uh, so a kilo of citrus ends up making quite a lot of marmalade. So you're going to have to, I don't know, join, uh, give it to the school fate. Like it, you need, you'll need a small amount of citrus goes a long way. The recipe you guys have is one kilo of citrus. And I don't mind what kind of citrus. You can mix them all together. Um, you can use um, just one, like blood orange marmalade is amazing. It's very different to lime marmalade. So just use what you have and what you like. Marmalade basically means that the skin is in there as well, whereas jam is just the fruit. So marmalade has a bittersweet um, taste to it, which is wonderful um, if, if you like those flavours. If you don't like bitterness, then I would suggest making orange marmalade uh, rather than making um, lime marmalade, for example, because the, the skin on regular navel oranges is not as bitter. The trick to making marmalade is that the first, very first step is that you need to soften down the skin. People who make really average marmalade, that first step, they um, shorten it down and you end up getting like kind of quite hard bits of peel in your uh, marmalade. So it kind of tastes a bit like there's like shoe leather or something in there. So really make sure that first stage of softening down the fruit, you take your time. This is not something you start at seven o'clock when you get home from work. This is like a weekend job. Um, so what I have here is I've already softened down all my peels because that takes about an hour to an hour and a half. Uh, but I just want to show you how to chop, chop it up and get that sorted. So I've done a combination of oranges and limes here because that's what I had. Um, but when, um, and I'll do an orange so you guys can see that, whatever um, citrus you're doing, cut it in half, and then I want you to juice it. So we're going to use the juice as well, but I just want to be able to very um, 
finely cut up that peel and it's much easier if the juice isn't in there. So I'm just going to juice that. And then it's sort of up to you. I quite like my marmalade quite thin, so with very pretty thin strips of um, citrus suspended in gel. If you like it chunkier, that's fine too. So I'm, I've got my um, half, that, that half there. I've then cut it into quarters. So you can see I've got these two um, bits there. And then I'm hoping you guys can see this, but I'm doing long, very pretty, nice strips. And I'm using um, actually a tomato knife, which is a paring knife, which I find one of the easiest to get through that skin. And then what you'll end up seeing is quite pretty, just little thin strips. To me, that is the nicest way to eat marmalade. So take your time when you're cutting it to get the nicest, um, thinnest amount of peel. Uh, if you were using older citrus, um, the, the thing that it will be absolutely fine to use, the thing about citrus is that it has pectin in it and pectin is what makes your jam set. So if your um, citrus is older, what's happened is that the pectin inside that fruit has deteriorated. So as soon as you pick a lemon off a tree, it's got the most pectin in it that it will ever have. As it sits in the fruit bowl, um, that pectin drops and drops and drops. So it might just take a little bit longer to set, or if it's really older fruit, I would recommend you adding some extra lemon juice in there as well, just to beef up that pectin, or just one fresher piece of citrus, just to give it a bit more um, pectin in there too. So then what you do, you cut up all your fruit into your pot, you put all your peel and the juice and three liters of water. So for every kilo of fruit, it's three liters of water. When my oranges were so juicy that I actually cut that water back a little bit and it has more like two to two and a half liters of water in there. Um, and, but if your lemons were drier, you would stick with that three liters. Then you simmer it. And what will happen is that the water level will drop and also the citrus peel will become almost translucent and start to soften. So what I, um, I'll pull one out so you guys can see. Um, that's been cooking for about an hour and a half. That's a piece of lemon peel in there. But the way that I check is that I put it down on the board and I just squash my finger and without pressing too hard, that disintegrated. So what that means is that when I add the sugar, it's not going to be too tough. If you don't soften it correctly, once you add the sugar, it will candy and then you'll get very um, hard bits in your jam. So this is really nice and soft. I'm sorry you can't see inside the pot. It looks a little bit swampy, but once you add the sugar in there, it will definitely clear up as well. I really like adding some flavor in there as well. So some grated fresh ginger would be very nice. And ginger is around now and in season. If I was doing orange marmalade, I might put some cinnamon sticks or some cloves in there as well. Um, when I do lime marmalade, sometimes I put um, some rosemary or some thyme or a bay leaf from the garden uh, with lemons. Lemon marmalade is lovely. Um, and you can really go anywhere with that one, but a, a nice herby, um, herbs and lemon is a very nice combination. So don't be afraid to use savory uh, flavors in with your citrus as well. And you would just cook that um, to flavor it at, in your pot too. Um, so then what you've got to do is that's ev everything's nice and soft. Now here's where we get into a little tiny bit of maths and science. And the reason why I want to talk you through this is that it means that you don't actually need a recipe. So you guys have got a recipe, which is good. But what I want you to do is understand the craft and the process. The key to making marmalade preserved so that means that no mold or bacteria will grow in there is that you have 60 percent sugar so i know that seems like a shitload of sugar sorry to swear central coast library but it is a shitload of sugar but what happens is that amount of sugar is what's going to stop mold from growing so in order to get that measurement you've got to measure out what this um, softens down i guess fruit pulp is and I'm lucky I've got a pot that tells me so I can see that I've got one litre 
of fruit liquid in there. So then I do the maths and I'm like, okay, 60% of a litre is about 600 mils or 600 grams, give or take. So that's why you don't need a, I mean, follow my recipe. It does work, but sometimes your fruit is juicier. Sometimes the water liquid drops down too much. You know, there's a lot of variables that it's hard to write in a recipe, but that number of 60% sugar is what's going to stop the growth of bacteria. A lot of old school recipes do 100 to 100. So if it was a kilo, you know, a litre or a kilo of uh, fruit pulp, you would do the same amount of sugar. I personally think that's too much sugar. Like it's, too, I find it too sweet. So if, but so I'm, I'm happy to drop that down to 60% and still feel confident that no mold is going to grow. I hope that makes sense to you. If you're afraid of sugar, avert your eyes right now because I'm about to pour 600 grams of sugar in here, and you're all going to get scared. But also don't forget that it's, um, you know, I'm probably making about five jars of marmalade here. I'm not eating that whole jar of marmalade in one go. And if I do, it's probably better than having a can of Coke. So we're just going to let that one go. But preserving uses um, ingredients from the pantry in order to stop the growth of bacteria. And sugar is one of those. So I don't have the heat on while I'm dissolving the sugar in. Because if your um, fruit is boiling really rapidly and you throw the sugar in, it can candy on the bottom. So I've turned the heat off. I've dissolved the sugar just from the residual heat. And then I will turn the heat back on again. And it, this will start to boil and bubble. While the sugar is in there, you want a steady rolling boil. Not a like big giant volcano, but a good steady rolling boil. Um, and the reason for that is to make your marmalade set, you need to bring the pectin from the fruit, you need to bring acid, which is lucky because there's a lot of acid, natural acid in citrus, so that needs to come together. The sugar, which is the 60% sugar, and heat. Those four elements all have to come together and that's what creates this that, that perfect gel. If you are having problems with your marmalade not setting, one of those things in that equation is out. And often it is the pectin. So often you're using older fruit. And if you're buying fruit from the um, citrus from the supermarket, you know, it could have traveled a very long way before it ends up into your trolley. So that could be part of the problem as well. But try to make sure whenever you're making any kind of jam or marmalade, is there enough pectin? Is there enough acid? Is the heat high enough? Is there enough sugar in there? And that's what will create the gel. I've used caster sugar today. So caster sugar doesn't have any colour and it doesn't have any flavour. So it's really good for preservation. If I used raw sugar, it would work, but it would be quite caramel in flavour. And if you used brown sugar, it would almost be molassesy. So you've got to want those flavours in there as well. For sugar alternatives, um, look, when my kids were little, everything was sugar alternatives and no sugar touched their little faces. Um, it backfired. They just drink Slurpees at KFC all the time now. But the other thing is, is that your preserves don't taste as good because all those sugar alternatives have a very strong flavour. There are lots of people doing good stuff out there online if you're diabetic or you want to reduce your sugar. But what I want to teach you is how to preserve to fill up the pantry, and it is that 60% sugar as well. So I'm going to just pop that back on the stove and bring it up to the boil. Um, and it will probably take maybe about 20 minutes. Uh, it would take a little bit longer, depending. But the, the longest part of marmalade making is when you're softening down the peel, not once you've added the sugar. Once you've added the sugar, it should, if you've got all those elements are correct, it all should come together quite easily. I want to talk you through sterilising jars and, you know, um, how long to stir, um, keep your marmalades for, but I just want to let that cook for, for a while first before we do that. Um, does anyone want to ask me any questions about marmalade or sugar um, or cooking it at this stage? Yeah, there are a couple of questions that Great. have come in. Um, Pip yeah. has asked, is using adding commercial powdered pectin as good as using extra lemon juice for setting? Sure. Commercial powder um, pectin is absolutely fine to use. It is a natural product. So it's where it's been 
um, processed, quite heavily processed from citrus. The issue I have with it is it costs money um, and you don't really need it. So the commercial pectins are great if you're struggling to get your jam to set or if you're using low pectin fruit. So if you wanted to make a very lovely raspberry jam, there's not much pectin in, in raspberry. So you, you have to add so much lemon that it might overpower the flavor of the raspberries. So that's where I would use commercial pectin. With this case, in this case, I would just add lemon juice. Um, because I don't want to buy something else that's been processed and flown in from Germany. So I, I will leave that with you. Often with pectin, if you don't use it right, you can taste it. It's got a kind of gluey aftertaste. Um, so there's jams, sugars as well, jam setting sugars where it's a mix of sugar and pectin. Again, I feel like you can taste it, but I'm, you know, a bit hyper vigilant about that stuff. So it's absolutely fine to use. If you've got some in the pantry, use it up. But citrus and citrus zest, Equally is equally good for pectin. Thank you. Um, do you warm the sugar before adding the fruit? You definitely can do that. Um, I cook a lot, but I am a lazy corner cutting kind of a cook. So I just want to do the thing that's going to take the quickest amount of time and use the least amount of pans and pots. I feel like if you've learned that from your mother or your grandmother and that feels like it's a nice part of the tradition, do it. For me, I just turn the heat off. And then I dissolve the sugar um, into the hot liquid, but I don't, it's not boiling at the same time. So I guess by heating the sugar, you're basically speeding up that process of dissolving it in here and you're not shocking it by adding it in at a cold temperature. But yeah, this is the way that I do it. But like, I just also don't want to take away anyone's family traditions because they all are wonderful and they all work. But you don't actually need any, you don't need to buy anything to start preserving. So I use all secondhand jars. I mean, that's a Cornersmith jar. It's still got the label on it. But I just save all my jars and I just use regular pots. Having said that, I do want to tell you about pots. So I've got, I wish I'd put it in this pot. I don't know why I didn't. But when you're making jams and marmalades, you want, a lot of people make them in stock pots because that's their like big pot. That is, is the wrong move. So you're looking for something with a wider surface area. So shallow and wide is better than narrow and tall. And the reason for that is that you want to have really good evaporation and stock pots aren't made for evaporation because you're at when we're making stock, we're actually trying to keep liquid in there. Um, so yeah, that shallow and wide, try to find whatever pan you've got that has that, that has those measurements. The very best ones, and um, I've taken it back to work, so I can't show you, are that shape. And um, that means that they sit evenly over the heat and then they open up like this and they allow for good even heating and for good even evaporation. So if you're getting serious about your jam making or chutney making, I would recommend getting yourself a preserving pan. Um, but otherwise, just go with whatever you've got that's got a heavy-ish bottom and is shallow and wide. And just with um, marmalade making, um, it's better for it not to be aluminium because of the acid in there as well. So stainless steel would be the best way to go. Do you blend the marmalade or does the peel uh, fall apart without mixing? Yes, the, you don't need to blend it. But having said that, I like there to be a bit of um, texture in my marmalade. So if you wanted it to be completely pureed, by all means blend it. But what you will get with um, this recipe is you'll get a nice gel with some soft but intact um, pieces of peel within it as well. If you're doing grapefruit marmalade, sometimes the skins are a bit tougher and it's got that really big, fat, white pith inside. If, that, if you're finding that overpowering in flavour, you can scoop out some of that white, which will also make it quicker with the softening down as well. Is there much pectin in rhubarb? Uh, rhubarb's medium. So I just made yesterday a very delicious rhubarb and apple jam, uh, but it's that apple has more pectin in it. So often at Qantas, people think we're making really interesting combinations, but I'm just being like a scientist in the background, a chemist, I guess. So I'm like, yep, green apple's got that much pectin, rhubarb's got that much pectin, that jam will set. Apricot doesn't have much pectin, so I always add a lot of orange zest and orange juice into it to introduce pectin. 
And luckily those flavors go together. So it doesn't, you don't have to do jams and marmalades that are just one thing. You can introduce, but use it as a way to be introducing pectin as well. And also Google's very helpful if you don't know how much pectin is in something. When you're making marmalade, you're using sugar to stop the growth of bacteria. And the, that, that basically that means that nothing can get through the hostile environment that the sugar creates inside that jar. Not hostile to humans, hostile to bacteria. When um, there's a million different ways to preserve, but the five preserving agents that you all have in your houses already are sugar, salt, alcohol, oil, or vinegar. So any of those ingredients in very, very high levels um, stop the growth of bacteria and make your food last and like for a very long time as well. As soon as you start playing around with the sugar levels, so dropping them down, you're basically making an environment that um, bacteria wants to grow in. Um, so that's just good to keep in mind, like really understand preservation before you start playing around with recipes. Once you understand the process out of it, it's, you, you know, go for it, do whatever you want to do. For um, salt preserving, it's a really great thing with citrus. So there's a uh, Moroccan and North African recipe, which is preserved lemons, and they're basically salted lemons. In China, they preserve um, kumquats in salt. So really, I'm happy for you to preserve whatever citrus that you want in salt. But traditionally, um, the one that we, got, we all know and that we use in our cooking is lemons. I thought these were lemons. Um, someone gave them to me, but they're actually limes. So we're going to be preserving limes tonight, but it's exactly the same recipe. When you're um, using preserved lemons, it's something that adds a punch of citrus flavour and salt to any dish. So you could chop it up and very finely and pop it through a, a, a avocado or tomato salsa type thing. It's delicious in any sort of tagines or stews. I often put it through a grainy salad. So uh, a couscous salad or a white bean dish, a little bit of preserved lemon in there is delicious as well. The other night I made a chicken soup that was a little bit average. So I very thinly sliced um, some preserved lemon rind and put that through it and it just added salt and freshness to it as well. So once they're in your um, household, I just want you to start using them in everything because they're so delicious. Um, and they're very, very easy to make. So when I go to the shops and I see preserved lemons for $18, I cry laugh because really all that's in there is two lemons and a bit of salt. And this is, this, this is one that is, there's no excuses. It's so, is that easy to make? So I have sterilized this jar, which basically means that I've given it a hot soapy wash and then I've popped it into the oven for 10 to 15 minutes until it's dry. On the recipes that come through, the full instructions of how to sterilize is on there. Having said that, there is so much salt in this recipe that I think a clean jar would be absolutely fine that you don't need to go to the effort of sterilizing unless you were doing a very big batch or you were giving them away or you, if obviously commercially, if you wanted to sell them, definitely sterilize the jars. So in my jar, I'm gonna do a tablespoon of salt. Now the kind of salt you use in preservation is really important. Um, I just want next time you are at the shops or next time you're buying salt, just have a look on the back of the label. If your salt has anti-caking agent in it, or added iodine, those things aren't great for preserving. And basically what that does is that the additives in the salt will change the clarity of your preserves. So when you're pick if you're pickling with salt that had those things in there, it could make the brine go dark or cloudy. So for any kind of preservation with salt on a higher level, I want you to choose salt that is just salt. I don't mind if it's sea or river or lake, I just want it to be salt. And I just also want to do a little shout out that we live on an island and we're completely surrounded by salt. So we need to stop buying the Himalayan salt and also the Molden salt, both lovely salts, but we've got amazing salt producers here in Australia that need our support. Um, so just again, no iodine, no anti-caking agent. Both of those things aren't great for preservation. So just salt. And I don't know if you can see, I'll hold it up. I don't know what the light's like there, but it's not too fine. And it's not rock salt either. It's sort of a grainy salt. Um, if you have a whole lot of um, pink Murray River flakes in your pantry, start using them up. But you do not need expensive salt to preserve. 
So if you, you don't need to go and buy flake socks for preservation, you will go bankrupt. It's too expensive. But just, you know, a, 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 an Australian salt with nothing else in it but salt. I've got a tablespoon of salt in the bottom of my jar. So that's probably about 20 grams. I'm then going to quarter my citrus. Now these limes are little, but it would be fine if they were bigger as well. You still keep them in quarters. And what I do is basically layer the citrus and the salt until the jar is full. So for a jar this size, and that jar is 300 grams, I think it will probably need about 60 to 80 grams of salt in there. What I will do here, and I hope you guys can see this, is I'm just going to pop them in. I've got them kind of um, face down at this stage, mainly because then I need to get in there and press down to start releasing the juices. So what you are looking for, oh, these are really nice and juicy, so it's easy to do. What you're looking, while I press that down, you guys can see all that um, liquid in there. So the lemon juice or the lime juice and the salt will mix together and they will create a very acidic, very salty brine that covers the lemon peels and that's what's going to keep them preserved. So it ends up almost being a bit like resin, like it sort of goes, a, um, it doesn't go hard, but it, it goes a little thicker, a little bit viscousy, and it's keeping everything really, really well preserved. So they stay a very bright yellow um, and no mould generally grows in there either. So then I'm going to do another tablespoon of salt. And it can be loose measurement. I mean, you can, you know, start weighing things out, but I'm happy for you to just go with your, go with your gut feeling. So I'm pressing everything down. Luckily, they're really, really juicy. If your citrus was a little bit dry, you may want to um, juice some and then top it up with um, uh, some extra juice because they really do have to be covered by juice in order to preserve properly. So you don't want any sticking out of the top there. And then I'll do my last. So that was about uh, three or four limes, I think, which is feeling pretty good. If you wanted to, you can add flavour in here too. Um, so you could add some chilli flakes, you could add a bay leaf, you could add some peppercorns. Um, sometimes people add a um, cinnamon stick in there as well. So I hope you guys can see that that's entirely covered by juice. The salt hasn't dissolved. It will take up to six weeks to dissolve. Um, so they need to sit in the pantry for six weeks before they're fully preserved. I'm just wiping any extra salt off there. This is a very clean tea towel. Don't use a dirty dish rag. And then I will put the lid on the jar. Now that could be, in this case, for the preserved lemons, it would be absolutely fine to use a plastic lid as well because nothing is getting sealed here. Basically all we are doing is making an environment that's got the lids on it, but it's really, it's the salt and the lemon juice that is preserving these as well. After six weeks, you could go and check them. Um, and if the uh, salt hasn't dissolved yet, then they need to sit for a little bit longer. Once all the salt has dissolved, and it just looks like they're sitting in like a, a, a I guess a yellow almost um, gel, then you know that they're ready to go. You open them up. If there is a white, light white bloom on top, do not freak out. I generally just give that one a rinse and just keep using it. Um, if there was black mold on top, you have to enter at your own risk. I can't tell you what to do there, but um, black mold is not great. If there was any sound, like if you were pulled out of the cupboard and you could hear a hissing sound, that is not good. Your preserves should not sound like anything. Unless you're making sauerkraut or kimchi, then you do want some sound. But for this kind of preservation, you want silence. Um, and then you have a smell of it. It should just smell lemony and fresh. If it's if there's an odour that you just can't bear, if there's nothing in you that compels you to eat it, don't eat it. But otherwise, if it looks good, if it smells good, if it's silent, carry on and use it. You can keep your preserved lemons either in the pantry or in the fridge. It sort of doesn't matter. The only time I would put them in the fridge is when it gets very, very hot over summer. Um, but I actually leave mine in the pantry. And I've got some in my pantry I think I made two years ago, and they're really, really good. 
So it's harder for things to go wrong because salt is such a safe preservation method as well. I really recommend making these. If you make these um, at the end of winter, make sure you make enough that are going to get you through until it's citrus time again. Because adding a little bit of preserved lemon to a dish is like adding a squeeze of lemon in some ways. So you don't need to buy lemons during the summertime. I hope everyone saw how easy that was. That was like a five minute job. And you can just make one jar. Please don't feel like you have to make 20 jars at all. That's very, very quick and easy. I want to open up to questions for that because often people have questions about that. It's too simple. Okay. So there are some questions. Um, does a dishwasher sterilise jars? Yes, a dishwasher does sterilise jars. However, you want them also to be completely dry. Um, so what I do is a hot soapy wash and a rinse. And then I've got these ones here, which I've just popped into a baking tray. And then I slide that into the oven. And the oven's probably like 100 degrees. It's not super hot um, until I know they're completely dry as well. With the lid, um, it's a bit of a, I'll, I'll give you a couple of methods and we'll do what suits your personality. So the safest method, the method that you learned from Cornersmith, everyone, is that you boil that for five minutes and then you let it air dry. Um, because that this isn't good in the oven because lids nowadays have plastic in there and that heat, um, the dry heat and the plastic isn't a good combination. So if you are a nervous Nelly, um, and or you want to sell your products or make bulk, I would really recommend boiling those for five minutes and then letting them air dry. If you're just making stuff for your family and friends and you're not too worried about it, you just get a bowl. I put the lid in there. I pour boiling water on top, shake them around a bit, and then dry it with a clean tea towel or paper towel, like not the bottom of your dirty apron, you know, like, just, you know, be mindful basically. Now, if you're a loose goose, um, which is fine, I am actually a bit of a loose goose in my home, but I would just like open the drawer, look for a lid, you know, shake it off if there's anything on there and put it on top. Generally, it's not the lid and the jar that causes mould to grow. It's often that people have reduced down their um, preserving agents, i.e. sugar or salt, um, or they, their jars aren't sealed correctly and oxygen's gotten in there as well. So yes, you can use the dishwasher. It will depend on how you're feeling about this whole process. Um, often just a clean jar is absolutely fine as well. But if you are doing bulk, I would go through the whole process because it's really disappointing to lose a batch of stuff, especially over our hot Australian summers. Excellent. Um, Pip has put in a question about um, when she was preserving Maya lemons in salt, was that she put them in a large glass clip jar or a screw metal lidded glass jar and turned them occasionally, all the metal spring lids, parts and screw lids were rusted that's away. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what happened. So I recommend, I know there's a lot of recipes that do tell you to do it in a large jar. The issue I have is that um, a lot goes wrong and they have to sit for a really, really long time until they're properly preserved, which does allow for the rust to happen. A couple of things. I would much prefer doing it in smaller jars. The other thing is if anyone has a crock, like a ceramic crock, that's how preserved lemons are often preserved in Morocco. Um, so absolutely fine to use. If you are having problems with rusted jar, uh, rusty lids, so you can see here that I've left a big gap at the top. So that salty water will actually never touch that lid um, because I've left like half a centimetre there. Having said that, I could also put a little bit of baking paper down and then put the lid on top as well. When you're preserving lemons, this doesn't need to be a, a fully sealed jar because the salt is so strong in there um, that we're not trying to make a sealed jar like we will with the marmalade. So yeah, yes, I think that's a problem. And I, I often feel like sometimes the plastic lids are better because you don't get that rusted. So sorry about that, that's a real bugger. Um, and Susan has a question about how long they keep for. Like you can leave them in your will to your grandchildren. They just go on and on and on. They will darken in colour. They might, um, the, the gel will, could get thicker as well. But 
The problem with preserving is that everyone wants an answer of when this goes off. Preserving has been around longer than use by dates have been around. So you actually have to engage with your senses. You have to look at stuff. You have to smell stuff. You've got to stick your finger in things. Um, and, you know, we have a, a gut instinct, which we've all forgotten when it comes to food because we're so reliant on supermarkets and corporations telling us when it's time to throw something away. So without giving you all a big lecture, we, all, we have senses and it's really important to use those in the kitchen um, and that's what's going to be the first thing that stops you throwing edible food away as well. So I will tell you five years just to tell you something, but I just made it up right then, like really, really long time, like 10 years probably. I don't know if that answers your question, but years. That's if they last that long. That's if they last that long. Um, and Alex has asked, are the lemons salty with this method? Are the lemons salty? Yes, they're very salty. Yep. So what we're looking for is that it's almost like a cured lemon. It's something you use in savoury dishes. Um, once Now that you know that preserved lemons exist, you'll start seeing it in every single Ottoling recipe that's ever existed. In the um, Food Savers book, there's a whole page of how to use preserved lemons as well. I think also if you've got the Use It All book, there's um, sections in there of how to use it up. Um, but it really just adds um, uh, intensity of flavour into any kind of savoury dish. So last night I did roasted potatoes and I put chickpeas in there with lots of paprika and some chopped up preserved lemon and roasted it in the oven and it was very, very delicious. So it's just anything that you just want to give it a bit of oomph, I guess. Well, that, that throws to... Joni, who's asked, do you wash the salt off the preserved lemons before you use them in food? Um, well, there won't really be any salt left because it will have absorbed into the um, fruit itself. So if they were very, very intense, I guess you could rinse them. You shouldn't need to, but you only use a very small amount. So I don't think I've got any in the here to show you, but if um, we'll pretend that's preserved. Basically, that um, pulp there will have completely disintegrated or almost disintegrated. Um, so you can, you can get rid of that if you want to. And then you very, very finely chop the um, skin. We're pretending this is six weeks have passed here. So almost dice it, I guess. So you would only use, you know, a teaspoon if you, like, if you don't like things too intense. I mean, I would probably use a tablespoon or two. Um, and then it's that bit that goes into your dish, almost like lemon zest, I guess, in a way, but more intense in flavour as well. So you can um, take it off, take the salt off, but you just probably wouldn't add extra salt to the dish. It's this that's being used. Okay, just a quick question from me about, about them once they've been preserved. Mm -hmm. Are the, the rinds, are the peels nice and soft? Yeah, oh, so they, they should be very, yeah, they should be soft. They should be quite malleable. Um, they will still be completely holding their shape, uh, but they will be, yeah, and they will soften. So if after they've sat for a year, they're going to get softer and softer. So it will be a bit of a process. When you first open them in six weeks, they probably will be still be quite firm. If you try it again in six months, they're going to be softer again. In six years, they're going to be amazing. They're going to be really delicious and but very, very soft. Very nice. Um, Fiona's, oh, question's going everywhere there. Um, okay. Once you open a jar of preserved lemon, do you store them in the fridge or back in the pantry? I think you... Yeah, it's kind of up to you and your personality. I, my fridge is, like, insane. Like, the top two shelves are just entirely jars and my teenagers just scream that there's no food. Um, so I try to get some things into the pantry. Uh, and preserved lemons I seem to have no issue with. If you have a very hot kitchen, I would recommend keeping them in the fridge. But, yeah, mine go in and out. I think we've got to remember that a lot of this stuff was also, you know, people were preserving when there wasn't much refrigeration or if any refrigeration. So we don't need to be afraid. Excellent. Good choice. Um, Fiona said that she has preserved bush lemons before. She thinks it was successful. However, they have a lot more inner white pith and she needs to take this off. 
then start the rind to use it. Yeah. So whatever, like, so with the Maya lemons, um, they're those lemons that are very thin skins. I don't actually love them for preserving because you're not getting much skin in a lot of ways. Um, but then there's the bush lemons that are really pithy. So whatever um, citrus you end up using, at some point you will have to make a decision along the way, and that might be that you cut the pith out earlier or you cut it out later. Um, but, yeah, I mean, any kind of citrus is good. And as you can see, that's um, a preserved lime, which will be great. I did do preserved oranges and they were a bit disgusting. Like orange and all that salt didn't, didn't quite give what I wanted. But that's how you find out whether you like something or not. Exactly. Experiment. Exactly. Um, we've got Betty has popped in. I wish I could cook like you. Those potatoes sound amazing. <laughs> Lemon, chickpeas, potatoes, and what was the other thing? Um, there was the preserved lemon, oh, paprika, lots of paprika. paprika. And I think I did also microplane some garlic in there as well. And it was very Lovely. yummy. Yeah, mm. everyone gobbled it up. <laughs> um, and Margaret has popped in to use juice or is it just the juice when you press down on it? So if your lemons or limes are really juicy like I did, I just with my thumbs I was able to release all the juices out of there. Um, if they're drier, you will need to top it up with extra juice to make sure they're completely covered as well. Um, but, yeah, the, you definitely need there to be juice and it doesn't really matter where it comes from. If you've got, like, if your thumbs aren't, um, you know, as strong and big as my thumbs are, you could use um, a mallet or the back of a rolling pin also to release out some of that juices because that was actually quite intense. Like, that was a lot. If you were doing a lot of jars, you might get sore thumbs. If you've got um, one of those cocktail musher things as oh, well. Oh, a muddler. Too. I think That's I'm going to call muddlers. muddlers. Yes, use yeah. that up as well. I'd like to move on to the gin and tonic bitters because I know that's why everyone's really here. Um, so I'm just going to grab my pot. Now, this recipe is, sorry, this looks so gross, and I've been very excited because I've been saving it all week for you. So every time I've juiced something, um, I've just popped it into a bowl I just had that covered with a beeswax wrap, but a container would be fine as well. Um, what we're going to make here is what's called a bitters. It is not a traditional, you know, bitters that you're buying for $50 from the bottle shop, but it's the Waste Warriors version. So anything that has um, bitter flavours or aromatics in there is how we want to flavour this liquid. It ends up being salt, uh, sorry, sweet, um, very citrusy, and with whatever herbs or spices that you use in there as well. And then you end up um, kind of creating a syrup, I guess, a light syrup, which is so delicious in a gin and tonic. So we don't buy tonic in the house really anymore. We just have a soda stream. We, so it's ice, lots of ice, full glass of ice. Um, the gin, if you, if you want to use booze, um, and then the same amount of the bitters and then just soda water. It's also really great when you're not drinking and it makes you feel like you're having a grown-up drink that's not cordial um, because it's, it, you get all those flavours as well in there as well. So it's good for the, for the alcohol-free amongst us or the alcohol-free days. So I'm going to put all my – I don't even know what the recipe says. I can't remember because I just make it up every time I do it. But I'm putting all my citrus scraps just into a pot like that I made my um, daughter a honey lemon ginger tea the other day because she had a sore throat and I just got one weird little knob of ginger left. So I'm going to slice that up and put it in there. Having said that, you do not need to have ginger in there, but that's I'm going to take it in that direction. You could add in there things like peppercorns would be delicious. I want to keep it quite savoury. So I'm going to do a big... Um, you know, crab's claw of peppercorns that are going in there. And then I've got some star anise that will be really nice. You could use cinnamon sticks. You could use juniper berries. Um, definitely you could use herbs from the garden, so bay leaves and rosemary. Um, there are barks that you can buy that have bitter in there. So if you are a real kitchen witch, um, get online and try and buy some of these beautiful barks. And that will make it properly bitter as well. So any, I know everyone's got a spice cabinet full of all things, strange things they've bought. So start emptying that out. Coriander seeds would be really lovely in there as well. And then you cover it with water. So I think the recipe says two cups. You could do two to three cups. It's a really, it's a moving recipe. It doesn't have to be exactly what I've said there. 
Um, I almost want that to have a little bit more water in it. And then you add sugar in there as well. So again, if you want it to last for a long time, you need to have more sugar in there. If you want it to be less sweet and you're happy to use it within a week or two, you can ease back on the sugar. Just keep in mind, tonic is sweet and it's also full of flavor. So it's two things. There's a, there's a bitterness to it and there's also a sweetness to it. So I would say for this, you'd probably want about half a cup to three quarters of a cup of sugar in there as well. Um, and then you basically just bring that up to the boil. Let it boil for, or when I say boil, sorry, simmer, like a light simmer, probably for 15 or 20 minutes, then you turn off the heat. I would put a lid on that, which I will do after this glass, and let it sit overnight so that I'm really infusing all those bitterness and all that flavour in there as well. And then tomorrow morning I will come out, I will drain, I'll strain that all out and discard all the scraps, and then I'll probably have about, I don't know, 250 to 300 mils of bitters, which I'll just pour into a clean bottle or a jar, something like that would be totally fine, and just store that in the fridge. And then it's ready to go. Make sure you're tasting things all the time. Um, if you wanted to, you know, I had some um, some old mandarins. No one's going to eat. You can chuck them in there as well. So really, it's your it's your peels. It's your half squeezed things. It's the citrus no one wants, and any kind of intense aromatics. And you'll make some batches that are more, you know, have different flavor profiles than other ones. It's really nice to do. Um, I did a grapefruit and bay leaf and um, black peppercorn, that was really delicious, which would be really nice even if you wanted to have that with rum as well. So you can mix and match and, and see how you go as well. So basically the premise is your scraps go in the pot, it gets um, just covered with water, half a cup to three quarters of a cup of sugar, give it a mix, simmer it for about 15 to 20 minutes, um, and then turn off the heat, cover it, and let it sit overnight. And then the next day you strain it out and that is what is your bitter tonic flavour. Really, really delicious. Please, everyone, give that a go. Do we have any bitters questions? Um, we have. Um, Judith said, can you put cloves in there? Yes, please. Cloves would be delicious. Whatever you've got that needs using and whatever flavour profile you like is perfect. And Pip says pineapple skin works well for a tonic too. It does. Pineapple skin is great in there. So when it's summertime, that's a really nice version to do. And, and uh, I actually have a weird pear that snuck in there as well, which I will put in, but I just thought it's citrus class, so it's a bit weird to talk about. But you could put, like, if you had a handful of strawberries that no one was going to eat, chuck them in there. Like, it does, it'll give a bit of colour and a bit of extra flavour. It's almost like a little bit of a cordial kind of vibe yeah. happening. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an adult cordial, grown-up, bitter yeah. <laughs> cordial. Also very good for your digestion. <laughs> um, Faith has asked a question in relation to the preserved lemons. Um, yeah. Do you use the juice from the jar? Of it will, preserved lemons? Oh, yeah, but it also sort of disappears. So the juice and the, and the salt kind of come together um, and absorb into the preserved lemons and there won't actually be much that much. It'll be more like a gel around it rather than juice after about two months. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you could sometimes I taste take a teaspoon of this sort of thick, um, goopy gel and add that to something like a soup that needs a bit of extra flavour. Um, so it's just going to taste like salt and acid. There's nothing you can't use in that jar. You can use it all. Okay, I think, is there any more questions? Oh, could I add this to red wine to make mulled wine? Yeah, I don't see why you couldn't. The only thing it will do is it will create more bitterness in there. But, yes, that would be yummy. Now that you've said that, I feel like that maybe is what I'm going to do as well. Um, yeah, nice it would, it, I know, wouldn't it? It will just make, just don't forget, it won't just be sweet. There'll be an added um, bitterness in there as well, which is yummy. That will cure any cold. <laughs> Definitely. And um, we've just popped in there as well to the, um, the link, which is just for you guys, um, especially for you guys to, if you would like to purchase your own copy of 
food savers if you jump onto the corner smith website using the link that's in the chat um for you guys it's 10 percent off at, at the moment that's a special thing for coming and joining us online very um, nice just put that back up there so can i just quickly talk you through setting point before you all go off to bed oh it's only eight o'clock that's all right you can still go to bed um, so basically this probably needs, I mean, I can eyeball it and see that it still needs a little bit more thickening, but when you're getting to the point with your marmalade that you want to start testing it to see if it's ready, um, I recommend putting a couple of dishes or bowls into the fridge or the freezer so that they're nice and cold. Um, with, mar with jams and marmalades, it's a little bit different. So if you've made jam before, you know that you put a tablespoon of jam down on the plate, you run your finger through the middle, and if the seas part and stay apart, you know your jam's ready. With marmalade, because there's so much more liquid in there, my advice is that you turn it off. Um, you can always, um, with jams and marmalades, you can turn them on and off as many times as you like. So don't feel like you just have to go into panic mode and start not being sure if it's set or not and jar it up. Absolutely fine to turn it off. I then would put probably like quite a bit, like four tablespoons into a bowl or a little ramekin would be absolutely fine as well. And then you can see how hot and steamy that is. I'm going to pop that in the fridge and I'm going to let it sit probably for about half an hour I'm not going to keep this cooking while I'm waiting so that when I come back and have a look at it, if it is set and it's a gel-like consistency, I will then reheat my marmalade and know to bottle it. I think people get panicked about setting point um, and they make a decision without really know, knowing what's going on. So just like have a big deep breath, turn everything off, fill up a jar or half a jar or a ramekin. You can put it in the fridge, you can leave it out, go and have a bath come back and then you get to, then you can make a better choice about whether it's ready to be bottled or not, because there's nothing worse than bottling this up and then it's runny. And then you've got to, you know, deal with all that again. So just slow everything down a bit. I can already see, and I'm sorry that you guys can't, but a, a skin is forming on the top, which is a really good sign that this marmalade is going to set well. So if there's that kind of, it's a bit like a custard skin on the top, um, and that's still very, very hot. So I will um, leave this. I won't cook it any further. I'll pop that in while I'm cleaning up. Um, I'll let it cool and that will give me a really good indication if that's going to set or not. Once you've got your hot marmalade, so if you bring that back up to the boil again, you bottle it into hot jars. So that's when I put the jars into the oven. Just for that 10 minutes, I bring them out and I pour my hot marmalade into the hot jars and then I put the lid on. Because there is 60% sugar in there, nothing else is needed. You don't need to do anything else. You can just pop those away in the pantry once they're cooled down. If you've played around with the sugar levels, what I want you to do is heat process them or heat seal them. And that information is on the recipes. But basically, that's where you boil the filled jars with the lid on in boiling water um, for about 10 to 15 minutes. And that's going to heat seal the jar which will mean that it will buy you extra time. So you could probably then store it for five years in the pantry and not worry about it. So there's kind of two methods there. One is that you just fill up your hot jars, you put the lid on it, you put it in the pantry. My guess is that you'll probably get about 12 months out of it. Or you fill up your hot jar, you put the lid on, you then boil those jars for about 10 to 15 minutes and then they can go into the pantry and they will last for years and years. So all that information is on the recipe card and there's information on our website. Any of the Cornersmith books have got information about heat preserving in there as well. It is not a hard thing to do, but it's a good thing to do if you're uncertain about how things long things last for. I think that is now 8.02 and I'm very aware that everyone wants to go to bed <laughs> um, or finish their night off. I'm still here if anyone wants to ask me any questions, but I hope that um, little courses like this just kind of like take some of the fear out of things that would have been, you wanted to try but you didn't quite know where to start. Preserving is really, really easy to do. You don't need any equipment. You don't need to buy anything. You don't need any special knowledge. You don't have to be a great cook. All you have to do is kind of follow some simple steps. Making any preserve, once you know how to do one of it, you know how to do it all. So jam is jam, marmalade is marmalade. 
Um, salt preserving, it's always the same thing, um, just in the slightly different versions of. So please um, do some preserving. Uh, you can follow Connor Smith on Instagram or on Facebook. We give lots of good tips away and waste hacks away. Um, and the cookbooks are really good of, um, with quick, easy preserving recipes in there as well. So thank you, everyone, for coming. And I'll just stay here, I guess, Catherine, for a few more minutes in case anyone wants to ask me any more questions. But it's literal season now, so you've got to, you've got to get cracking. You've got about two months. Well, I've got, I've got my big. Um, jar of lemons sitting here waiting to make the um, salted lemon. So Very um, good. I will let you all know how, how that goes. But I just yeah. like to say a big thank you, Alex, for joining us and for sharing your wealth of knowledge about preserving. And just a reminder for everyone, if you click on the link in the chat, you can go and grab your book from Cornersmith or you, this is actually a library copy. So we do have copies in the library as well too. So feel free to jump online and reserve a copy. And Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us, and we hope that you've had a good time, and we'll see you again soon.